You're listening to Sustainably Geeky, the podcast for everyday environmentalists. Hi, you're listening to Sustainably Geeky, episode 62. Today, I am joined by Miriam McDonald, who has a background in ecology and conservation and has spent over 10 years working in alternative agriculture. She is interested in the relationships between people and landscapes and how our past gives context to and shapes our future. The exploration of this led her to write Emergent, which explores the roles that people play in ecosystems and how we might bridge the worlds of agriculture and wilding through an exploration of humans as participants in landscapes. She currently lives and works on a 160-acre restoration project in the Derbyshire Dales, practicing and experimenting with the ideas explored in Emergent. So, Mim, thank you so much for joining me today to talk about this important topic. Um, Can you start by just kind of giving us a little more context about your journey into this field and what um, inspires you to write the book Emergent? Yeah, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, Yeah, so I started off in conservation. Um, I went to university, I did ecology, and I was working in conservation. And I was starting to feel like um, in Britain, we've got relatively small reserves um, and there's a lot of human effort focused on those reserves. And it started to feel like the reserves were just too small and too vulnerable um, and especially like facing things like climate change. The, the problems that the reserves were facing weren't stopping at the reserve boundary. And it was very difficult to actually protect, like to protect anything really in such a rapidly changing environment. And I started to think, why, 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 how had we got to a place where human systems put such a massive amount of pressure on natural systems that we were effectively just degrading them? Um, and I started to think what human systems we need to sustain us, and food is obviously a big one. And so I switched into agriculture because I was sort of interested in, could agriculture be made less impactful? Um, and why... You know, why was it done how it was done? Um, so I started working on a mixed organic livestock farm. And over the course of sort of five years, I learned to see the world as a farmer. And I got really interested because I could see the world as a conservationist and an ecologist. And I could see habitats in that way and how I would manage habitats as a conservationist. And then I could see the exact same landscape as a farmer and as a farmer, how I would produce food from that landscape. And how I've managed that landscape to produce that food. And the two ways of viewing the same ecosystem didn't marry up at all. Um, and the action that I would take as a conservationist or as a farmer was often very, very different. And I got really interested in like why that, you know, why that was like that, why I could see the same thing in two different ways. And so I dug back into like 500,000 years of British history, trying to figure out what humans had been doing here. Um, and I sort of did that over the course of 10 years and I compiled this massive amount of notes and I had I got a, a Word document that was so big that Microsoft Word refused to open it. Um, so and then and then a sheep dislocated my knee and I decided to sit down for eight weeks while it healed and I pulled all of those notes into a book um, and the book was turned out to be this book. Um, but it was a bit of an accident really writing it. Well, that's cool. No matter how it happened, um, we're glad that you were able to get it all down. Um, I know, you know, just just trying to write a paper is is a feat. So writing a book is <laughs> is very impressive. Um, and I'm really excited to talk about this topic because it really complements um, a lot of the the things we've already talked about on this show. And in actually, our last episode was talking to. Um, a regenerative farm in the U.S. So this is an interesting look across the pond at kind of what's being done over there. And um, yeah, I I think, you know, we'll get into this more, but we're seeing these quote unquote alternative practices pop up more around the world. And it's just interesting to me how we're um, kind of, uh, I don't want to say regressing because I don't think we are regressing, but we are shifting back to um, some of these things that used to work so well and we're realizing what what we've advanced to isn't actually that advanced. So I'm really excited to to get into this with you. Um, So first, I just want to start by talking about something that you touched on in your book 
Um, you start off by discussing what's called shifting baseline syndrome, which people may or may not be familiar with, um, which is a phenomena that has hindered acceptance of and progress in addressing many environmental problems. Um, can you kind of expand on that definition? Um, what is this shifting baseline syndrome? And um, do you think there is a way to kind of guard against this, you know, into the future as we're looking at more and more environmental challenges? Mm, yeah, um, good question. Um, so shifting baseline syndrome was first sort of identified in fisheries management. Uh, so looking at, so, so sort of like the observation that when somebody came into a career looking at how much of the fish stock you could take, uh, they sort of took, they took the number of fish that they started their career with as the baseline level and then decided what you could take sustainably from the baseline level. And over time, what people at the beginning of their career were deciding was the baseline level got lower and lower and lower. Um, and nobody was sort of picking up on the fact that over time, uh, what we assumed was a baseline was was shifting. Um, and then people start, started looking in a lot of different places. And um, it's sort of across the board that when a human's born or starts looking at something, um, they just assume that's the, the, the default state. And then only notice change uh, from that state. And so over time, you can have massive, massive changes occurring and nobody really picking it up or flagging it. And because biological systems change at a much slower rate than a human career or a human lifetime, you can have these vast shifts in systems without anyone noticing. And that's sort of one of the big problems, um, one of the reasons why we've been so slow at noticing what's happening and responding to it. And I think, yeah, like guarding against that is really difficult, isn't it? Because a part of that is an artifact of how long we live for. Um, like a human has got a lifetime and within that lifetime a human's got a career and so the sort of the, the the duration of that career and lifetime are pretty fixed but for me um, the way to guard against that is by having strong intergenerational knowledge transfer so I think especially in the western world there seems to be this we don't really there isn't that much knowledge transfer from the older generations to the younger generations. It's just sort of like the grandma nagging on in the corner. It's about something, isn't it? Um, but I think honouring that far more would help protect against shifting baseline syndrome. Because I remember my grandma telling me about how many ladybirds there were when she was little. And then I was like, yeah, but I don't see them. I, I think you're making it up, grandma. So, <laughs> so like, but I think having a greater respect for elders in a community and more opportunity for children to converse with people who were like a generation or two separated from them would really help against that and I think in careers a similarly strong uh, sort of like almost induction process of like what has happened and what's been noticed by the person in the career before you know before the new entrant um, and I think our education system as a whole isn't massively good at honoring past knowledge I think it's all about looking forward and what what we can do in the future without massively sort of embracing what we've observed from the past um yeah so i'd say yeah intergenerational knowledge transfer would be like right up there for, for me in combating that yeah and i would i would like to hope that with um technological advances like you know i don't know uh, satellite imagery for instance you know we could use that to see the changes happening in the environment but um i know a lot of times <laughs> people are very selective in the data that they look at. So hopefully, yeah, those things will be used for good and not um, not kind of ignored or overlooked. But uh, I agree, yeah, there, there needs to be a little more focus on the long term than I think just what's right in front of us right now, because I always used to wonder how did, you know, we have uh, in, in the U.S. a continent covered in trees or whatever natural resource you want to name and they just came in and basically slowly wiped it out systemically and nobody noticed that it was all gone but I think that was kind of part of that syndrome is yeah we're not we're not paying attention to what happened before us and just taking whatever we want so um okay so you know talking about the effect of humans on the natural environment um you wrote that humans as a species have never known a complete world and that we have radically changed the way our ecosystem functions by removing or severely impacting many species that have previously helped shape our environment. And I found that very um, impactful because uh, you don't realize that you didn't 
you know, you, you weren't growing up in a complete world or incomplete world until it's kind of pointed out to you that these things are missing or have been um, removed. So um, what are some of the ways that humans have taken over uh, some of the functions of other species um, for better or worse? Hmm. Um, yeah, so I'm mainly going to speak about Britain because I sort of understand the British context a lot more. But uh, so in previous in, um, interglacials in Britain, we'd got elephants and rhinos and lions and all of the things that you sort of more typically associate with Africa now. And obviously they're not, not here in this this interglacial. They didn't make it back across before the channel flooded. And then since the channel flooded, we've sort of got rid of a lot of other species like wolves and boar, bear, beavers. Um, so. So yeah, we're we're in Britain. We're really, really far from anything that's remotely complete looking, and I think humans have sort of been plugging the gap for as long as we've been taking species away. And so, uh, like a like a typical one would be, we don't have elephants here, sort of knocking trees down anymore. But farming has a really, really long history of um, tree clearances, so opening up small glades in woodlands initially to start to uh, grow annuals or to graze livestock in. And um, and we've sort of done that, you know, we sort of started off clearing small areas, um, mimicking what an elephant was doing. We then, we you know, went, as, as farmers introduced domesticated livestock, uh, livestock sort of replaced the large grazers that were here a human's relationship with livestock is very similar to a wolf's relationship with large grazers. So humans were sort of plugging the role of the wolf. And this is the sort, and it's sort of like a chicken and egg thing because by a human taking the role of a wolf, the human is in competition with the wolf. So the human gets rid of the wolf. So it's sort of, we start to take over a different or another ecosystem role and that can lead to us getting rid of the sister, the, the, the species that we're taking over the role of. But then we can also, that cannot, so, so, so it's like negative and beneficial in one, in that we've potentially, you know, knocked something out of an ecosystem, but then we've taken its place and filled that so the system continues to run in, you know, potentially in a similar way. And I don't think it's sort of, it's very difficult, isn't it, when you're talking about such long time spans that people can only gather from, like, gather information on from, you know, historical records and archaeological records. It's difficult to tell what happened first and how it all went, you know, how it all fitted together and whether, you know, whether it was us being bad or good. Um, and it ends up just being this system, doesn't it, that evolves. And humans are a part of the system and some of what they do has beneficial effects and some of what they do has negative effects. But I think you can see... You can see a lot of um, a lot of what we choose to do as farmers and also as gardeners as plugging uh, vacant ecological roles. So when we're mowing a lawn, we're just replicating what sheep would do in a farming system or what wild grazers would do in a wild system. Uh, and the same with digging a pond. If you're digging a pond in a garden, you're being you know you're putting in a pond as as a deep, as a beaver would have done, or if you're uh, you know like putting in an irrigation system or something we're sort of always any interaction that we're engaging with you could see as us uh, engaging as a species in an ecological interaction rather than like a human just imposing uh, their decision or something on a on a landscape yeah and i know you mentioned wolves as a an example and um while we may take the place of certain predators, I guess, in some aspects, uh, I, I don't think humans are ever the one for one substitute, because like, I think you mentioned the the removal of wolves in Yellowstone in the US had a lot of trickle down effects. So even though, yeah, we may be um, kind of filling that role in a lot of ways, there's other uh, parts of the ecosystem that we're not affecting that, that maybe they may have monitored or whatever. So it's an interesting balance that we have to figure out, right? And uh, <laughs> we're not always good at that as, as humans who want to kind of be in charge of everything, I think. Um, yeah. And so uh, speaking of, you know, human involvement in the environment and uh, 
I guess, being a part of the environment. A lot of times, historically, Western attitudes have been uh, towards conservation that, you know, humans should be removed from nature in order for it to thrive, right? That, that uh, the only way for it to be as effective is if we're not there. And you talk about, um, you know, how this contrasts a lot with indigenous ways of thinking um, that also science is kind of catching up to, um, that humans actually can have a positive relationship with nature and the natural environment. So um, do you have, I, I guess, any experience or, or examples of this as well, since I know you're kind of working in this field and implementing these practices on a daily basis? Yeah, so I think... We're so trained to see humans as something completely separate from the natural world, aren't we? And I think um, it sort of becomes second nature, doesn't it? But we are part of, you know, we're we're a species like any other species, aren't we? We're part of an ecosystem, um, and and we've been engaging with that ecosystem for as long as humans have been around, um, and we engage in different ways. So, so there's sort of like the roles. So I would view it as the roles that uh, other members of the homo genus have filled. And then I would view it as things that specifically homo sapiens have done. And, um, and across the board, what humans tend to do is add dynamism to landscapes. And so we're pretty powerful connected you know pretty powerful species that are connected to one another in social groups that can have an even bigger effect and we do add a massive amount of dynamism to landscapes and in a world where we've got rid of a lot of the megafauna that were previously adding that dynamism humans can create landscapes that that, that keep on moving so if you've got an area of woodland we don't have anything with the power in britain to take out woodland anymore um but humans can fell areas and keep it moving. Likewise, um, likewise, we can create areas of wetland that perhaps other species can't create. So we've got this power, this ecological power, to maintain landscapes that are dynamic mixes of woodland and grassland and wetland, all sort of moving around one another. And we take that obviously way too far, that power way too far, and end up like trashing stuff. But we do still have that potential to engage positively in a way that keeps things dynamic without overdoing it and making them really, really disturbed and, and uh, too agricultural. Um, we've also got a massive potential to increase the diversity of a system because we're a global species. We can move things around the globe. We can move things locally. Um, if something does go locally extinct, we can bring it back in if we choose to do that. And that's got a negative and a positive as well, because you could accidentally introduce an invasive species or you could introduce wolves back to Yellowstone. But we do have this potential of increasing diversity by moving other species around. And we've also got this potential of having a stabilising effect in ecosystems, because um, if the various varying population levels uh, of different species get out of balance. So in Scotland, there's a hell of a lot of deer. Uh, and nothing particularly to, you know, remove those deer. So they're overgrazing the landscape and getting rid of a lot of woods. Um, but people can go and harvest the deer and eat them. And we've got that power to take out what is a sort of an overly abundant species to sort of bring that ecosystem back into balance and stabilise it more. So we can, you know, we can keep landscapes dynamic we can enhance the diversity of those landscapes and we can stabilise those landscapes if we choose to participate in them in a way that, that, you know, where we're aiming to do those things, where we're not aiming to extract money from them or extract another resource from them. And that's what we're trying to do on the farm. We're trying to figure out how we, how we as, a, as a species, you know, as humans interacting with the landscape can have a beneficial effect on it um, and not a negative effect. So we are... Uh, we're largely, um, so we've introduced grazers, so we've brought in a species to graze a landscape, so to graze the landscape at a level that supports grassland, the grassland species, but also allows woodland to regenerate. Um, we've also brought in species that have gone like locally extinct here that wouldn't have arrived back otherwise because we're in a fairly agricultural landscape. So we're enhancing diversity 
And then we're managing the land in a way that if something is overly abundant, we're taking it out and using it. So we're sort of enhancing diversity and stabilising the landscape. And that's what we're trying to figure out how to do and trying to research like what level of interaction with the landscape is beneficial before it flips into being too intense and as having negative impact on our landscape or the other way where we take out our input completely and the land just sort of well in Britain it would just go it would all just regenerate through scrubland back to close canopy woodland and its diversity would lower again and you'd lose all of the sort of the um, grassland species and the species that depend on that on the grassland plants. Yeah well it's good to hear that uh, there is a focus on how to, I guess, <laughs> use our powers for good <laughs> um, and be an asset to the environment rather than a detriment, which I think is why a lot of people maybe formed that opinion that humans just ruin everything. <laughs> so just, you know, pull the people out. Um, but that is also very, you know, insensitive to communities that have lived in and, uh, uh, been a partner with the local landscapes for for hundreds or thousands of years that were then displaced so that you know in the name of quote unquote conservation so I am glad to see there's a focus on uh, you know renewing that relationship with the land and, and recognizing that we can be good stewards and not just takers <laughs> of, of resources um, yeah so so I want to kind of talk about the the farming system, the regenerative system that you guys are practicing and that a lot of folks are, are starting to focus on now, thankfully. Um, you know, our, our current industrial agricultural system uh, really focuses on separating natural systems to maximize production of one or two crops or livestock. And you talk about this in your book, um, rather than raising a diverse combination of plants and animals that live and thrive together. Um, and so, you know, this may result in larger yields in the short term, but it's not sustainable. And we're seeing the consequences of these monocultures um, today in, you know, farms that the land only has a, a finite number of crop seasons left, or, you know, it's just completely stripped of all nutrition. Um, so, can you explain uh, for our listeners why these monocultures are bad for the environment and for human and non-human health? Yeah, so in uh, like in a in a natural system, you have a very high level of diversity, and that diversity uh, allows a lot of different relationships to be formed between a lot of different species. So, say you've got ten species of grass, ten species of herb, and ten species of grazer. You have an enormous number of relationships between all of the different plants and all of the different animals grazing those plants. And that's not getting into all of the invertebrates and all of the soil life and all of the predators that are also around that system. And each of those relationships can flex and move. So if one of those grass species gets massively dominant, one of those grazer species will probably target that grass species and push it back down to uh, background levels again. And so the whole system is sort of flexing around itself. And if you get a very, very dry year, it's likely that some of those plants will cope better than other plants and carry the system through. So the grazers will switch to eating the plants that could survive, allowing the other plants to survive at sort of background levels, just bumbling along and not, you know, not forcing any of the grazers to go extinct. So the system can sort of shift around uh, different weather patterns and different you know and different sort of climactic shifts and it gives the system uh you know it, it gives the system stability the diversity gives the system stability and what farmers have tended to do is notice that in optimal conditions certain plants grow better than others so you might notice that like one species of grass grows really really well in a perfect year and then they sort of naturally think well if i grew only that one species of grass and I didn't waste all my space on all these other sort of peripheral species of grass. I could keep, you know, X many more cows. And they sort of tend to think, well, if I didn't have all of these wild grazers on my ground, if I only had my cows that I wanted, they could eat all of that really nice grass and I'd get more milk yield or whatever. And it's, you know, it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Like that that is how 
that's how you would manage a system if you're wanting to make your living from it and if you're you know if you're required to make your living from it um but in doing so you sort of open the door to a lot of like sort of unforeseen problems really in that once you've only got one species of grass if you have a year that's very dry or very wet and that species doesn't do very well um you've basically got to try and figure out how you you know how you deal with that so a natural you know sort of a natural conclusion is then to think well I'll put drainage under the field to stop it getting too wet if it's a wet year uh, potentially I could water it if it's too dry and it's a dry year I could potentially add more fertility to make it grow more um if I get like weeds um coming up because you know because there's only one species in that field other species are going to be wanting to move into that field the whole time if I get things that I don't want coming up I need to try and get rid of them with herbicides and it sort of ends up being an equally complex system but the but in but instead of having all of the different species of grass grazer and herb you end up having different inputs that you're putting into that system to try and stabilize it artificially and those inputs end up being fertilizer herbicides pesticides uh, a lot of fossil fuel energy um and all of those have got consequences for the larger ecosystems that that field or whatever is a part of and they've also got consequences for the people who are eating the food produced by that ecosystem um because one species of grass isn't going to nourish like one species of grass fed artificial fertilizer isn't going to nourish a cow in the same way that a diverse pasture would nourish a diverse selection of herbivores if we're eating milk drawn from that cow it's not going to nourish us in the same way as eating a diverse array of meat drawn from a diverse array of grazers grazing a diverse landscape um so it has impacts for us nutritionally so it has sort of like wider impacts for our for the ecosystems that that field is a part of and it has impacts on our like diet and our nutritional status as humans yeah, it also just sounds exhausting to try to manage that, right? Like yeah. <laughs> you, you're taking a system that functions usually pretty well and then you're transforming it into something that you think is going to be more effective and you're actually just creating more work. And like you said, mm -hmm. using chemicals and so much water and manpower and it's like, I don't know, just <laughs> maybe go with what, what nature gave us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You end up, um, it's like a, because you can obviously produce way more milk from a simplified system than you could from a diverse system in a good year. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, it's, you, you, you chase the occasional win, don't you? For You put a hell of a lot of effort into chasing the occasional win rather than expecting and working with a lower but more stable production of a diverse, a diverse array of food. Yeah. And, uh, you know, using the cow example, like, I would imagine, well, I know a lot of times they end up having to buy feed when the grass isn't working or, you know, like they're not getting, so, so then you're, you're adding another expense and you're feeding them something that they're probably not made to digest. And that creates all a whole other slew of issues. But, you know, if you, like you said, just had kind of a more diverse buffet of grasses for them to pick from, if one goes down, then, you know, they can eat something else. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a scientist, but <laughs> that's just my, my take on it. Um, so, okay. So, so that's kind of how the, uh, the, the current, I guess, prevailing industrial system works or doesn't work in a lot of ways. And, you know, we've, we've alluded to the fact that you work in this quote unquote alternative agriculture uh, space for many years, um, and, and this focuses more on bringing back techniques that are often considered historic by Western standards, um, but they are still practiced today in many indigenous communities and becoming more mainstream among uh, farmers around the world, as we've mentioned. So can you describe how these practices differ from the other, you know, the, the current kind of prevailing system and how they can be used to feed an ever-growing world, which I think is the, the big argument put forward for industrial ag, right, is that, well, you can't feed people with these small-scale, diverse farms. You need the monocrops, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so all of the sort of the different approaches to alternative agriculture 
share a common thread, which is basically trying to figure out what happens in natural systems and trying to mimic it in farm systems. So you, you know, you try to diversify what you're growing. Uh, so you've got a lot of like, yeah, a lot of different things that you're producing in from one system. So you're trying to enhance the diversity in that system, which which means that you have a more stable farm system because you've got more interactions happening in that lands in that landscape. But it also means you're more stable economically because, say, one year your tomato harvest fails, you might have a lot of lamb. So you can shift. You can basically try and shift what you're selling to so that you're not entirely dependent on one thing working. Um, and with the enhancing of the diversity come, comes like trying to minimise the inputs. So instead of thinking, oh, wow, I've got loads and loads of docks, I need to buy in a herbicide to get rid of those docks, you might think, oh, the docks are symbolising soil compaction maybe, so you might change, how, change your farming practices. So it isn't this sort of knee-jerk, uh, buying an input to cure a like a perceived problem um it's trying to think of the system as a whole and how the whole of the system is functioning so that the system is supporting itself to function into the future without relying on external inputs being brought into it so you're trying to create something that's more self-sustaining or moving towards being self-sustaining and i think that is sort of the crook so so when people are asking, but can those sorts of systems feed us? It's, it's sort of, I think it comes from a place of first assuming that an industrial system can feed us, which I think is worth querying initially, because yeah, an industrial system produces a hell of a lot of calories and taken over the whole world. That is, you know, that's, that is a lot of calories, but, um, it's like way more calories than we need. You know, we don't need all of those calories. A third, a third of the, a third of the stuff that we produce globally is wasted, and a third of the land that we're using to grow crops on is used to grow crops for livestock. So that sort of, you know, so so we're actually living. We actually need a very small proportion of what we're currently producing. And, and that's you know that's just. That's just not sensible, is it? Like to start from this, to start from an assumption that we need all of the stuff that we're currently producing, um, and then to try and ask uh, alternative systems to match that in terms of the sorts of food produced as well. So, an industrial system has got a lot of focus on the production of annuals, uh, like the like wheat, uh, maize, rice, these sort of big annual cereals. Um, and a lot of research is put into how you produce those cereals. They're incredibly highly bred. The fertilizers and pesticides have been developed alongside the breeding of those. So it's created this system, this system as a whole. Um, and then when people try to take those same cereals out of that system and grow them without the pesticides and herbicides they've been developed alongside, of course, they don't do very well. And the yields are very, very low because it's because it's it's a system that supports itself. But when you start to look at like sort of the purpose of agriculture is to produce nutrition isn't it it's to produce nutrition to feed humans and when you go back to the basics of how do you actually feed humans instead of thinking how do you produce so many cal calories worth of maize um the question is sort of subtly different and a regenerative system is much more geared at producing um a lot of different types of food, but smaller quantities of each of those types of food because it's a diverse system that it's being drawn from, which makes it more, which makes it a more complete nutritional diet. The food is also of higher nutritional value because it's come from soils that are well fed and well nourished, and the plants are healthy plants. It's not just sort of these uh, uh, sort of empty calories almost. Um, and it's very very difficult then to compare one system based on producing one crop with a lot of inputs to a very very diversified system that's had very little research into how you produce that optimally it's not it's not a straight comparison and and i think you can only because you know because alternative practices are so young and because they're not widespread that the uptake of them isn't you know it's not across you know across everywhere it's very you you end up 
uh, sort of seeing what happens in small trial areas and multiplying it up and assume and seeing if you think it could feed everyone or not. And so it's very, you know, basically it's incredibly, incredibly difficult to know if alternative practices can feed the population, especially taking into account climate change, which makes everything incredibly chaotic anyway. Um, but I think there's some good evidence that small scale systems can. Um, so when you grow just one crop, uh, you might expect, say, say you grow a single crop on its own and you expect a 10 ton per hectare yield. There are some, you know, in a lot of cases, if you grow two different crops, you might get an eight ton per hectare yield and a seven ton per hectare yield. So neither are yielding as highly as one on its own, but combined produce more calories. So there's a lot of evidence that if you do produce more than one type of food and in the same place at the same time, you get more back cumulatively in calories. Um, and then obviously as you stack, you can stack different you can almost, if you've got human power, you can almost limitlessly stack in different things into the same system. So like Mark Shepard um, in the States, he's got tree strips grown on contour with grass in between them. And then he's growing, uh, he's growing veg in those strips. He's also getting all the fruit from the trees. He's moving different species of livestock, including grazers and pigs and poultry through those strips. And he's getting a high yield per acre from that system because he stacked all of these different things into one area across across the year. Uh, so there are, some, so there are sm some small systems that are producing a massive quantity of food that is really nutritionally dense from small areas of land. But they're very human intensive. Like they need a lot of human labor. Um, and that is very difficult to compare directly to a system that has got very, very little human labor, a lot of fossil energy put into it, and is producing a hell of a lot of calories, but arguably a lot less nutrition. Um, but, and I don't, I don't think, you know, it can't, it can't be answered, can it? Ag ag like, industrial agriculture can't say, yes, it can feed this population now, and yes, it can, you know, yes, it can feed it 10 years into the future, because nobody can say that, like, nobody can say, yes, you can feed, we can feed everyone 10 years into the future, but if I had to trust my life in one of those systems, I would trust it in a regenerative system, not a system that degrades the resource base on which it's, on which it's built. Industrial agriculture is degrading soil, and, you know, you can't just inevitably run something down and expect it to still keep producing. I think one system is building up and the other is running down. Um, and ultimately, I'd want to be, I'd want to trust my life to the system that is building up, not degrading. Yeah, it sounds like maybe um, instead of, a lot of times it's framed as an either or proposition and maybe it's a combination of the 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 crops that do better in this system, like you said, maybe wheat or, or things like that, um, you know, we can produce in that way. And the other more nutritious, dense uh, crops get produced in, in the more regenerative farms. Um, and, and maybe that's a balance we have to figure out. But yeah, it sounds like it, we're not comparing apples to <laughs> apples to apples, um, to use a, a plant metaphor. But um, that's interesting. And, and I also think it's important that we realize a lot of times the demand on the consumer side is probably not, um, it, it's, it seems superficially inflated in a lot of ways. So, so for instance, like we eat so much more meat than we need to. And if we could cut back the amount of meat, um, demand for meat or meat products, dairy products, whatever, then you know, we, we could adjust our farming systems to produce other things instead of these, <laughs> these calories that could be, um, you know, better, better used or, or reduce emissions or whatever. So I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah, hopefully, um, hopefully both on the supply and demand side, we can adjust to a way that's more sustainable for, for everybody. Cause Everybody in the world can't eat, you know, that many calories, like you said, or that much meat and, and still have enough to go around. We just have to kind of balance it better. Um, you, you talk about um, in order to avoid plagues and pests, diseases or weeds, regenerative, uh, regenerative farmers need to make sure that they are always present. And this kind of sounds counterintuitive 
in a way because a lot of modern farming focuses on, like you said, repressing these threats, getting the weeds out, getting the pest um, off of the plants. Um, but I guess for, for me, I kind of thought about it's, it's like taking a vaccine, right? You have to expose your body to those um, those germs in order to build the immunities up to them. Or if you're exposed to them, you're going to not be able to fight it in a lot of cases. So uh, what, what has been your experience in, in ensuring the need for exposure to these threats? Because I can imagine when you first start <laughs> trying to practice this, it can be a little frustrating um, while things adjust and, and maybe w what are some of the lessons you've learned from that practice? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think I first started thinking about it in um, parasite control in sheep. So sheep get a number of intestinal worms um, and the worm, the, so, so the sheep graze a pasture, they ingest worm eggs from grazing the pasture. The worm eggs then live in the intestine of the sheep and, and absorb some of the nutrients that the sheep would otherwise get. Uh, when the worm gets mature, it excretes eggs uh, that go that pass through the sheep in the dung onto the pasture. And then the worm eggs hatch on the pasture. And then the next sheep comes along, grazes the worm eggs. So the system goes, goes on and on and on. And a, a common, because uh, the worms are sitting in the intestines of the sheep and siphoning off some of the nutrients, Farmers tend to go, you know, they want all of the nutrients to go to the stock to let it grow faster. So farmers tend to go pretty hard on um, trying to get rid of worms, um, obviously. Um, but a sheep will create an immune response to worms if the worms are in its guts. So while the sheep is sensing that it's got worms in its guts, it's creating immune an immune response to the worms and sort of suppressing their ability to reproduce. So it's got adult, adult worms in its guts, but those worms won't be producing as many eggs because of the sheep's immune response system suppressing it, suppressing worm reproduction. And so I sort of started playing about with that. That was my first introduction. I had been worming sheep. Um, and the, and the, the other side of that is that worms gain resistance to wormers really, really quickly. So you've got to keep changing the worm that you're using to keep killing off the worms. Is so this, this like other... injecting an antibiotic, sorry, or, or, or something? Is that what it means to worm a sheep? Um, yeah, you, you, um, you basically squirt uh, uh, like an ivermectin thing in their, okay. in their mouth, which okay. then kills off the, it kills off the worms in their intestines, but also the byproducts of that get excreted onto the pasture with the dung, which also kills off earthworms and dung beetles and a lot of other invertebrates. Um, so it's got, so, so you end up, you know, it's got this whole other human loop going on about the response to worms, like the negative responses to, to worms and, far, and farmers worming stock to get rid of worms. And then, and then you've got a sort of a biological response to worms, which starts with a sheep repressing its worm burden. So fewer eggs are excreted under pasture. And I've been, I've not wormed my sheep for five years, five or six years. They've not had any wormer. And my growth rates are fine. They're fine. They're just, they're just getting on with it. Um, but I graze. So, um, so, so, so you've got to try and make sure that there are enough worms because the worm's only got a certain life cycle, that you've got to make sure that there are enough worms that the sheep has always got worms in its intestine, because otherwise it will stop creating the immune response. And as soon as the worms have gone, like worms will arrive back at some stage, because they just do. Um, and if the sheep hasn't maintained its immune response, it will get a sudden influx of worms, and it will lose condition and get like effectively diarrhea. Um, and lambs, so lambs, are a typical thing uh, obviously a lamb gets born it doesn't come with the immunity you know it's like the unvaccinated person it doesn't come with any immunity to internal parasites um, and how you introduce a lamb to worms to build its immunity without making sure you know with you know without without it getting so many worms that it over overruns the system it's quite a delicate thing and that comes down to the ecosystem that is surrounding the sheep so 
when dung goes out on the pasture, dung beetles come pretty quickly and they scurry through it and pull it all apart. And because they pulled it all apart, the the dung dries out and the worms in there, some of the worms die. Some of the well, some of the eggs die, and then some of the worms hatch and then die. Earthworms come and scurry through the poo and pull different bits of poo down into you know into their tunnels. And all of that lowers how many successfully how many worms successfully hatch out. And then a worm can only climb. So so the baby worm will climb 10 centimetres up into the grass. And then a sheep will come along and graze that 10 centimetres of grass and eat the worm. But if your pasture is 20 centimetres tall, the sheep will come along and graze the top of the pasture and the worms are all in the bottom. So if you maintain sheep on very, very short grass, a lot of those worms are going to get ingested by lambs. But if you've got your ewes and lambs in longer grass, the lambs are going to graze mainly on uninfected pasture and just ingest the occasional worm. So they get a very like steady drip feed of worms that Im- that build their immunity up over their first six months of life. So then if they are retained as breeding stock, the first time they're put in lamb, they've got, they've effectively just gained very slowly all of their immune resistance to the different species of worm. Uh, so I've been doing that and that is relatively effective. And also things like, um, uh, like growing veg. So aphids are like a common problem with veg growers and people are trying to get rid of aphids all the time, aren't they? Um, But basically you want to maintain aphids in the system. So there's always something for ladybirds to eat, because if you are growing veg, say you're growing veg on an urban allotment and you've got no aphids, so you've got no ladybirds. If the aphids blow in from somewhere, there are no ladybirds to eat those first few aphids. So the aphids have got time to multiply. Aphids are actually born pregnant, so they can multiply really, really quickly. Um, And if you're on an urban allotment, your connectivity isn't very good to your wider ecosystem. So it might take a while for ladybirds to get into your system, and by which time your aphid population is probably skyrocketed. Ladybirds reproduce slower than aphids anyway because they're not born pregnant. Um, So you sort of want the aphids to be present at background level to allow ladybirds to be present at a background level so that if anything shifts in that system for to allow aphids to multiply the ladybirds are already there to start to interact with those aphids and and multiply themselves so it's like and it's it's sort of so it's sort of ensuring that you've got a joined up coherent ecosystem that's got good connectivity to other ecosystems and wild landscapes and also ensuring that you've always got maximum diversity, even if some of that diversity are species that you like, ideally wouldn't want, or you know, or it would seem at first glance ideal not to want them, like pests or parasites. Yeah, so it's figuring out the balance, as with everything else, and uh, not freaking out when you see that, you know, one or two things. And, and yeah, the um, what, what you were talking about with the lambs, I mean, it sounds like a much cheaper and less labor intensive way of (laughs) building immunity than constantly having to buy the, you know, the stuff to give them the medicine and um, paying for that every season rather than just let your grass grow a little higher and then, you know, managing. I mean, it might be a little more, um, it, it might take a little more focus on different things, but in the long run, I think, yeah, to me, it just sounds simpler. (laughs) I wonder if a, a lot of the the stuff you're talking about um, really requires people to just let go of a lot of control and trust the system. And and I I think that's probably why a lot of people are reluctant, right, to go these routes because they need to know they have a way to fix the problem or to control the inputs or whatever. So, um, yeah, I I don't know how we, we overcome that because humans do just want to maximize efficiency and know it's going to work if I'm going to put in the work. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, farmers come in for a rough ride, don't they? But they are <laughs> economically tied to a system that if, you know, if for some reason something goes wrong with that system, mm-hmm. they don't have a backup income a lot of the time. So they're just, you know, they are just getting by. And yeah. I think it's unfair to put a lot of, pro- you know, like, oh, why aren't you doing that? That's just, you know, that's not as good as this. When actually they've got very little ability to shift. Mm-hmm. And I think there's also... Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think it is like um, relinquishing control slightly 
um, and the requirement of like almost faith in mm -hmm. nature to sort itself out. And I think, but I think for the first few years, there's also going to be drop in productivity. So if you're if you've been worming your stock, your stock are effectively you know it's akin to drug addiction. Like our agricultural systems, you know, can be seen as being addicted to all of these various inputs, mm -hmm. these artificial inputs that we've been running them on. And if you stop that input, the system's going to go through withdrawal. And there's going to be like this period of like chaos and diminished, you know, diminished yields as the system readjusts to not having that input. Um, and I think a lot of farmers can't do that because their finances won't allow that. They can't go like, oh, well, I don't need an income for three years. That'll be fine. Um, it's just not. It's a, big you know, it's not yeah. <laughs> it's a risk and it, it's. I mean, if it doesn't work or if something goes wrong, yeah, it's a big ask. And um, may maybe the solution is uh, governments, you know, helping or, or other organizations helping to supplement that income in the meantime while they're, they're transitioning. Or I, I don't know how feasible it is to do like sections at a time. It probably is better, you know, for it all to be connected. But Whatever it takes, yeah, to to kind of shift this gradually, I think is is definitely going to help in the long run. Do you, do you think that more farmers will try to adopt these systems, um, you know, into the future as they see how the current systems aren't working for them, and um, yeah, the potential of this alternative practices? Yeah, and I I kind of think they'll have to, and I think they already are. Mm -hmm. um, it's so just around here we've had we've had some insane droughts and we've also had some insane flooding probably going back five years or so um and people are responding to that like the ways that they were growing previously uh, just don't they're just not dependable they're just not working in the new climate reality that we've got so I think there is going to be this forcing pressure that's going to make people change like climate change is, is going to make farmers change how they farm Mm -hmm. And I think for me, the danger is that people adopt a new practice without changing the mindset that they're working from, because I think you can, you know, you can produce wheat with a hell of a lot of uh, turning the soil, a hell of a lot of herbicides, pesticides. You can also switch to minimum till organic system, but have not actually altered the mindset that you're coming from. It can still be based on this sort of exponential growth economic model that's sort of, you know that's that's fundamentally extractive without acknowledging just how complex and connected ecosystems are, and that we're playing roles in those ecosystems, and that's having an impact globally. Um, and for me, yeah, for me, the swapping out of practices isn't as important as shifting that underlying narrative of exponential growth isn't going to work on a finite planet and everything is connected and if you do anything it's going to have multiple uh, effects that you may or may not have foreseen um and for me like shifting the mindset is far more important than shifting the practice mm -hmm. yeah that's a, a great point in um I hope, yeah, I hope people do uh, do, do follow that. And and I am encouraged to see folks like you. And like I said, we interviewed or I interviewed Soulfire Farm last last month. And um, in the past, I've talked to James Rebanks, who's doing a lot of work in this in England as well. And um, to to see people that are going ahead with it and doing the things that we're talking about is very encouraging. And I hope that others will, um, you know also <laughs> follow their lead. It's, it's easy for me to say as someone who's not working in the field and um, wants to see a change, but I know that there's a lot more um, practical implications that go into the work. So thank you for what you're doing and for, um, you know, talking to us about this today. And um, I want to talk a little bit about biodiversity conservation or pre preservation and uh, in, in a lot of ways, these methods um, achieve that goal as well. Um, so a lot of the guidance around preserving biodiversity suggests that we protect a certain amount of natural habitat. Um, for example, the 30 by 30, 30% 30 of the world by 2030 um, goal. Um, 
But equally important, as you talk about in your book, is that the habitat be connected, um, especially for the, the carnivores and, and big species that require a large range. Um, so can you explain why connectivity is so important for these species, why they can't just exist in these little pockets around the, the world or the continent? And, and then why those species are so important for the ecosystems in which they exist? Hmm. So natural distribution. So, so when you see like the range maps of where a species occurs, it sort of like might cover, you know, a vast area of land, but it's the species isn't uniformly distributed over that whole area. Everything exists in sort of like clumps. So populations that live, you know, like might live in this bit of woodland here and then might live in that bit of woodland over there. And there might not be so much in the grassland in between or something. And and the sort of the the way that those pop, those little like subpopulations maintain themselves is through migration. So you would have a subpopulation that then is feeding into the next subpopulation along, and it's the movement of the genetics between one subpopulation and the next that keeps those populations thriving and diverse and healthy. And Species can only move between the subpopulations if there are channels for them to move through and ways for them to move. And sort of ha as humans have decided, oh, this area is going to be farmland or we're going to put a motorway here. Sometimes we've divided one population from another population and stopped that genetic exchange um, through time. And the effect of that is that you, you can end up with these populations that are still there they're still living but basically there's no fresh blood coming into that population and over time it, it that that subpopulation is going to go extinct just because no new members can reach it and the members that are there can't get out of it and that's so so you sort of get these local extinctions within the overall range of a species and sort of the the, the way to combat that is to make sure that species can move from one population to the next population and exchange genetics freely. And if you're thinking about something like a snail, that's movement in a generation isn't very far, uh, it can be relatively easy to maintain the connectivity of different subpopulations because they are, you know, they're closer together and they, they can, you know, they can... They exist, they, they're sort of, the, the distribution isn't as clumped and they, they can, it's, it's less likely that a human is going to put something in between that breaks how they move about a landscape because their world is smaller. Um, whereas a carnival is sort of the opposite end of the spectrum um, because, they, because they're carnivores, they need a large area of land because they need to hunt over a huge area to get enough prey of the sorts of species that they want to, um, to keep them going. And connectivity becomes really, really important over a vast area uh, because the range of the animal is so large and because the, because the area that the subpopulation the animal is part of needs is also so large. So, um, for car so carnivores sort of tend to highlight when landscapes are fragmented because if you've got carnivores in a landscape, you can, you know, you can you can sort of say with to some degree of certainty that that landscape is is effectively connected um and carnivores are very very important in landscapes because they are uh, a keystone they keep a lot of them are keystone species so the wolves in yellowstone are keystone carnivores so a keystone is something is a species where you might not have very many individuals of that species but each individual is very very powerful within an ecosystem so the wolves in yellowstone there aren't that many wolves in Yellowstone, but the effect that they have in predating, um, in you know, in, e in eating the grazers and basically scaring the grazers out of certain areas of the landscape because you know the, the deer or whatever knows that it's in danger of getting caught in a in a like a cliffy area, they won't go there, uh, and woodland can emerge in those areas. So carnivores have got these powerful top-down controls on ecosystems that effectively determine where grazers are, which effectively determines where um, woodlands and scrublands can regenerate. 
so it's yeah it's important to have the connectivity for carnivores to move move around a landscape to sustain their populations and have um and so, so that the carnivores can have an interaction with the landscape where they are and support the landscape to be diverse and a dynamic mosaic of woods and grass instead of just getting grazed grazed oblivion so scotland doesn't have any wolves britain is very very not connected to the continent because of the channel which isn't a you know it's not a human barrier obviously uh, but it does mean it is a very hard barrier for a wolf like a wolf can never migrate into britain um it's never going to get to scotland unless a human introduces it to scotland uh so britain is effectively not connected uh has no predators and large areas of it are overgrazed um but i'm not i'm not necessarily saying that we should reintroduce wolves <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting how um, people might not connect these apex predators to plant life, but essentially that's what the trickle down effect is, right? That they're kind of the gardeners <laughs> ensuring, you know, in, in a roundabout way that by keeping these other populations in check, the result is um, more trees and more more growth or whatever. So it is neat to see how everything's connected and Speaking of connectivity, you talk about um, the Gaia theory, which is something that I've heard in a couple of different books and discussions lately. So can you uh, expand on that and explain what that is? Yeah, so um, the Gaia hypothesis came out of a guy called James Lovelock was basically tasked by NASA to um, look for life on, you know, on other planets. And he started by looking at what life looked like on this planet. Um, and he he sort of, he realised that one of the markers of life was the stability of a planet. So we've got a pretty, like the oceans are a pretty stable salinity. The atmosphere is a pretty stable um, composition of gases. Uh it doesn't, you know, the, the salinity of the ocean isn't fluctuating and the percentage of oxygen in the atmosphere isn't fluctuating and hasn't for a very, very long time. And Lovelock uh, proposed that this was basically an emergent property of the complexity of the system of, so, so all of the species living on Earth interacting with the environment around them, so the rocks and the air, that all of those interactions effectively at a global scale create a system that regulates itself so um he proposed that on a planetary level the planet uh, the 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 earth is a self-regulating entity um and is regulating its oxygen content and you know the oxygen content of the atmosphere um and the salinity of the ocean to maintain the conditions for life so so you get this feedback that life has evolved to maintain conditions that support future life to evolve on a planetary level. Yeah, it's it's really interesting how uh, everything is 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 connected and kind of has this built-in system um, of checks and balances and and like uh, there's there, there's a pollinator for every type of plant or there's you know, a, a, a predator to check every type of whatever. And, and it's just fascinating that the earth has figured out how to, how to manage itself, like you said, and here we come and we're just kind of throwing a wrench in all of it by <laughs> increasing the CO2 levels that's having all these ripple down effects. And uh, hopefully we will get that under control better so that, you know, the earth keeps trying to correct itself, right? It, it keeps trying to get back to this balance and, and we're just humans, by we, I mean humans, are kind of messing that up. <laughs> and it's amazing how one species can have such an effect, but <laughs> but I digress. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so I found that very interesting and I'm definitely gonna, you know, look into that more because I've, I've encountered that a few times, like I said, and I think it's, it's an interesting hypothesis, so. <laughs> Any resources um, that you would share for folks who want to learn more? Mm. Um, I would say, uh, like for me, finding the Oxford Real Farming Conference was really, like, really good. There's a lot of resources passed through the Oxford Real Farming Conference and that network. Uh, Land Workers Alliance as well, also like really helpful. I found that really helpful. Um, 
And then I read a book called uh, Nature's Matrix. That was, yeah, that was very influential. Um, I read a lot of books and uh, some of them really stick with you, don't they? Um, like Patterning Instinct by Jeremy Lent as well. I thought that was a brilliant one. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, we'll I'll link to these resources in the show notes for anyone that's interested in following up with that. Um, well, I guess now we will move on to our green life hack section of the show, which is just where we share a practice, a product, a mindset, something that you can implement in your daily life if you're looking to just get started or, or just improve how you live more sustainably. Um, so do you have a green life hack to share with our listeners? Um, for me, it would have to be a mindset shift thing again. Um, I think I would say uh, like trying to think in systems was really, really influential to me and really, really helped me. And trying to think in food webs. So um, each of us, like no matter where we are, we are plugged into food webs. Um, so every time we eat, and every time we poo, we're engaging in ecological interactions. And where, you know, where does that go? You know, where does the food come from? Where does the waste go? How does that plug us into this wider, like, global system of energy moving about the planet? Um, and I think the other thing that I found really, like, really helped me was to think in verbs for a bit. Mm -hmm. um, so I think Britain, or like British, like English as a language is very noun based and very static and um for a while me and my business partner tried talking in verbs so uh instead of thinking like oh we're going to the wood um like well, we're going to go to where wooding is happening like where trees are growing um and that really helped me uh not see the landscape as so static and not see human interaction with the landscape as static um because i think I think ultimately a Western feeling of disconnection underpins a lot of problems. And for me, those were ways that helped me try and break that down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really neat. I've never, I never thought of that, but I might have to <laughs> implement that into my daily vocabulary is, is what is happening, not just that something is, is there existing. Um, my green life hack is not quite as profound, but um, it is food related. Um, so I have recently just moved back to Ireland and, uh, I, I love tea. I love drinking hot tea. So I'm in a good place for that. But, um, I am trying to be conscious of the fact that a lot of times the tea they sell in stores comes in these bags that aren't always compostable. Um, some of them say they are, but they, you know, may still have plastic bits in them. So if, if you drink tea, check on that before you throw it into the compost bin. Um, but uh, I will just um, encourage folks, if you do drink tea or even coffee, use the um, reusable infusers. They do sell loose tea in a lot of places and um, you can just fill up the diffuser, put it in your water rather than a tea bag and, and do it that way. If you drink coffee, they also sell, you know, obviously if it's a big coffee pot, like in the States, um, you can compost the filters, but if you have like a K cup, they sell reusable filters for those, not those terrible pods that, you know, can't be recycled or whatever. So that is my uh, green life hack is just green the way you drink, I guess, <laughs> your morning beverage or your afternoon. beverage. So, <laughs> well, Mim, thank you so much for being on the show. And uh, I want to give you the chance to share where folks can find you and or your book online. Um, so I am at, Miriam Kate McDonald on Instagram um, and we've also got a website called Holistic Restoration and the farm is called Woven Earth and it's just outside Matlock in the Midlands uh, all those things are on the internet somewhere <laughs> okay and uh, again the name of the book and it, is it available online or bookstores or where can folks find it uh, yeah the book uh, good point <laughs> um, yeah, the book is called Emergent and it is on eBay. And it's also available from the publisher, which is John Hunt. Um, and it's also available on Amazon, although I personally wouldn't buy from Amazon. <laughs> right. <laughs> Go to your local bookshop or, yeah, um, buy it, like you said, used or something first before giving your money to them. Well, um, the show itself can be found on um, all social media. 
and uh, YouTube and anywhere that you listen to podcasts. Um, so please do like, subscribe, and rate us, share, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you have any guest suggestion ideas, we welcome them through any of those channels. Um, I personally can be found on Instagram and Twitter at Het's Gonna Be Me, and this show and occasionally some of the other shows on our network, uh, Marginally Geeky or Epically Geeky. So you can see we have a theme. Um, so that's all I have for today. Uh, thanks again for listening, and thank you so much for being on and um, sharing your, your knowledge and experience with us. Thank you for having me. It's been really nice. Yeah. All right. Have a great rest of your day, folks.